Good morning. Good to see everybody today. You all sound like a healthy bunch. <laughs> we might have to invoke that uh, whole no shaking hands policy. Uh, the flu bug is really going around and it's nasty. So be careful out there uh, with all that. A lot of, uh, I heard this week they're no longer even accepting uh, people at the Lafayette hospitals because they are so over full with that and they're sending them on to Indianapolis. So uh, be careful with all that out there. We are in week three of our sermon series, Broken Things. So far we have looked at the broken life of Moses and the broken life of David and how God used both of these men for extraordinary things, even though they had weaknesses and sins and struggles that left them broken. Today we're going to move from the Old Testament to the New Testament to look at the life, the broken life, of another believer who was able to be part of something extraordinary, even though her life was broken. I want to tell you the story of a young woman who was possessed by seven demons. Not one demon, not four demons, but seven demons. A woman who has been speculated to have been a woman of ill repute. Some even speculate that she had lived an immoral life working as a prostitute. We don't know many exact details about her life before meeting Jesus. We just know for sure that Jesus drove seven demons out of her at some point before Luke 8, verse 2. Now, there are many who have speculated that the story from Luke 7, 36 through 50, is about this same woman, although there is no scriptural support for that. Those that believe that the woman mentioned in that text is one and the same as the one in verse 8, or chapter 8, say that her name is omitted from the text to protect her. Others believe that it's because of the faith that is displayed that these two people are the same. Others believe it to be her because she is mentioned first in that very next text in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, as one of the women followers who was traveling with Jesus and the 12 men who were followers who we know to be the 12 disciples. And I'm going to come back to that later. There are others that believe this to only uh, be a coincidence that these are two separate ladies. But I personally choose to believe that this woman could be our character from our study today, Mary Magdalene. There is enough circumstantial evidence to think that it could be her. And Mary Magdalene had a broken life. And that is the title of our message today. Her whole life was broken. She may have been sinful. She may have possibly been a prostitute. She was definitely possessed by seven demons. And all of it changed when she met Jesus. Let's look at our text for today. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36, reading through verse 50. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50 Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. 
You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, there are some face value things that we need to notice in this text. We have two people who are wanting to spend some time with Jesus. We have Simon the Pharisee, and we have this sinful woman. And Simon the Pharisee is wanting to check Jesus out for himself. And his motives and premises for being with Jesus were a little bit flawed. Simon the Pharisee wanted to check Jesus out. Because the Pharisees wanted to find holes in Jesus' story to try to prove that he was not the Messiah. If Jesus was the Messiah, certainly he would know people's character. And if Jesus knew this woman's character, he wouldn't have anything to do with her, Simon thought. And Simon came to these flawed conclusions... Since Jesus had accepted this woman, he does not know her character. And since Jesus doesn't know this woman's character, she doesn't, he doesn't know that she's a sinner, then he cannot be possibly the Messiah. Since Jesus is not the Messiah, then the Pharisees can reject his message and his ministry. And Jesus knows exactly what Simon is thinking. And so, without missing a beat, Jesus challenges him. You see, Simon was trying to use logic. And unfortunately, logic is only as good as the information that's gathered to support that logic, right? If the information is flawed, then the conclusions will be flawed as well. No matter how sound the logic might appear to be. You know, oftentimes today, people's reasons for not accepting Jesus are based on flawed logical arguments. For some folks, they're, they're thinking logically about this stuff, but they, they just don't see because they are basing their logic, their, their ideas, their thoughts on flawed ideas and thoughts. And they put up walls that can only be broken down by building relationships. And Jesus wants us to build relationships with broken people to help break through those barriers as his ambassadors. Now, Jesus knew exactly what Simon was thinking, and he exposes Simon's poor judgment and pharisaical view by making it clear that the Messiah was willing to draw near to the broken. We learn from the sinful woman, who some believe to be Mary Magdalene, that it is our brokenness that God wants us to bring before him. It's our brokenness that Jesus wants us to lay at his feet. It's exactly why it kills me when I hear people trying to clean someone up before they invite them to meet Jesus. Or when a person is deemed not good enough to participate in worship or serve on a ministry team because they haven't cleaned themselves up enough yet. Or when I hear someone tell someone else that they can't accept Jesus and be baptized because they still have too much sin in their life. Well, who do you think gets rid of all that? Jesus. Jesus does. And we don't. And if a person is never exposed to Jesus, is never given that chance to find Christ and choose to follow him, they'll never get cleaned up. Through Mary's broken life, this text shows us some truths about worshiping Jesus. First, worship is for broken people. If we think worship is only for perfect people, we are gravely mistaken and possibly slightly self-righteous. Jesus makes it clear in this story that worship is for people who are willing to admit that they are broken and are able to come to him with that brokenness so that he can put us back together. Also, worship takes place at the feet of Jesus. 
As I thought about this this week, I couldn't help but think about where I'm at when I come to worship. Where am I at? And I wanted to ask you that question. How often do you visualize yourself at the feet of Jesus when we come together to worship? How often do you visualize yourself at his feet when you go to pray? How often do you visualize yourself at Jesus' feet when you're singing praise songs in the car? How often do you visualize yourself at Jesus' feet when you're reading his word? You see, real worship takes place at the feet of Jesus. Next, worship is tightly focused on the person of Jesus Christ. If we are thinking of anyone or anything other than God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit when we are worshiping, then our worship is wasted. Where does your mind wander during our time of singing? What are you thinking about during communion time? What have you been thinking about while I've been talking for the last four minutes? And let's all be honest, we've all probably messed that up at one time or another where our mind has wandered away from what we are doing in here together. And I can't tell you how many Sundays I've sat in the pew and have been worrying about time. Where was my focus those days? When my mind wandered to how much time something was taking during the worship service. My mind was on pleasing people. It was on personal desire for our worship service to be excellent. It was on everything except what it should have been on, which was Jesus. On the Sundays that my focus has been just Jesus, I don't have a clue about anyone else or anything else. Sorry. I love y'all. But when we come together, our audience should be an audience of one. And his name is Jesus. And that's what our mindset should be during worship. Again, the next one is worship is not about receiving, it's about giving. If we come to worship every morning with expectations about what we are going to receive from it, what we're going to get out of it, then our motivation for worship is messed up. We are here to give to God. Our praise, our prayers, our singing, our offerings, our minds, everything, our whole broken life we're to bring before him and lay at his feet. Also, worship involves emotion. Folks, one of the biggest issues the independent Christian church has, in my opinion, is that we have tried so hard to keep false emotional responses from driving our worship that we have almost completely removed emotion from our worship services. I don't know if we're afraid that we're going to catch the charismatic bug or what. That's the only joke in this sermon, so... (laughs) Uh, But we have gotten to a place where we sit in here on Sundays and we hold back our tears. And we look around to see if anyone is watching us. And we refuse to raise a hand or clap or say an amen or respond emotionally in any way, shape, or form because we view emotional response to God as some sort of weakness. And I don't know if that's societal or a part of what we have done as a movement or a combination of both, but we need to understand that it's okay. In fact, it's important to allow ourselves to have emotional responses when the Holy Spirit moves us. And there's the amen that I needed. (laughs) So if you want to clap or raise your hands during a song, Clap or raise your hands. If you want to come up front and kneel and pray on your own during the invitation song. I had somebody from second service stop me after service last week. He said, you know, during the invitation song, I just wanted to come up to the altar and pray. But I wasn't sure if I was able to, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to. I was like, man, if you want to come up and pray, come up and pray. It's okay. (laughs) 
We're not going to stop you. If you want to allow the tears to flow because you're overwhelmed with brokenness on a Sunday, let the tears flow. It's okay to shed tears at Jesus' feet. It's appropriate when we come before Jesus with our brokenness to feel stuff. Sometimes raw emotion stuff. And it's okay to let that emotion go. Because guess what? We're all broken. (laughs) We're all broken. We all understand. And we're not going to think less of you if you show some emotion. We're not going to look down upon you if you show emotion. In fact, we should be coming alongside each other and holding each other up and encouraging each other as Christ has shown us. We need to let each other know that this is a safe place where we can let our brokenness show. Finally, real worship can't easily be stopped. And if all of you are looking at your watch, stop it. (laughs) Okay, there was two jokes. In all seriousness, when we get to the end of a worship service each week, we should desire in our hearts to keep going. Even though we stop, (laughs) and we're not going to have three-hour worship services, but even though we come to a stop, our desire in our hearts should be to keep going, to keep worshiping. When I look at the churches overseas or even here in America, if you go to a predominantly Hispanic church or predominantly African American church, it's nothing for them to spend two to three hours in worship. It's because they have learned the truth that real worship of our Creator God is hard to stop. And again, I'm not pushing for long services, but what I'm saying is maybe we need to quit looking at our watches and quit putting God in a time box. And saying, God, you can have this much time, but that's all I'm giving you, and then I'm going to move on to whatever else I've got to do. We need to leave here on a Sunday morning or a Sunday afternoon, and we need to long in our hearts to keep going. To the point that we do keep worshiping all week long, even when we're not in this building together. We need to worship Jesus daily, and not just in services, but we need to sit at his feet daily and worship him. The woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears knew what it was to sit at the feet of her Savior, tightly focused on the person of Jesus, giving all that she had. That jar of perfume was expensive. She gave all that she had to worship her King. And with true, appropriate emotion, she could not be stopped, not even by a Pharisee, not even by Jesus, who decided he would not stop what she was doing because what she was doing was righteous, true, and pure. Mary Magdalene is a picture of a person whose life was once broken, who became someone who was extraordinary once she connected her life to Jesus. Did you know the Some of these facts about Mary Magdalene, I want to share a few bullet point facts about her with you. Mary Magdalene is mentioned by name 12 times in the Gospels. That's 10 more times than Thaddeus. It's 8 more times than James, the son of Alphaeus, Bartholomew, and Simon the Zealot. It's 7 more times than Matthew, 2 more times than Thomas, 1 more time than Judas Iscariot. She's mentioned the same number of times as Andrew. Only Philip, James, John, and Peter are mentioned by name more times. Mary is the first of the women mentioned that is traveling with Jesus and the disciples. In Luke 8, 1 through 4, we see that Mary is one of the ladies who is traveling with Jesus. It says she and the other women supported the ministry of Jesus and his disciples from their own means. Not from the disciples' own means, but from the ladies' own means. They supported the ministry of Jesus. As far as I'm concerned, you take the cultural, contextual issues out of Luke's worldview here, and I believe that you have Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna, along with many other unnamed women, as some of the most dedicated and earliest disciples of Jesus. Mary Magdalene was present for the three most important moments of Jesus' time on earth. Mary is at the cross. 
She's the one that's mentioned first among the followers of Jesus who are at the foot of the cross to witness his horrible, painful death. And that is mentioned in all four Gospels. Mary is also one of the few that know where the tomb is. She is mentioned by name as knowing where the tomb is, and she was to be one of the first two witnesses to it being empty. And finally, Mary is the first to see the resurrected Jesus. And we see those last two things both in Mark 16. She's often referred to as Mary Magdalene, and many believe it's because she is from Magdala, a small town at the coast of the Sea of Galilee. But the Hebrew word for Magdalene means strong tower or fortress. And many scholars believe her being called this name is significant. It wasn't about where she was from, it was about her stature and her faith. She was a strong tower. A fortress of faith. She was considered and still is today a huge part of the beginning of the ministry of Christ. A huge part of the beginnings of the church. And it was all because of her great faith. A faith that the woman who sat at Jesus' feet also displayed. Today you might be feeling like your life is broken. That God really can't use you for anything important. That there is nothing that God could do to use you for something extraordinary. And I want to tell you today that the God who I know, through a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, and in experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, that God that I know can take the smallest, most seemingly insignificant and broken person and use them from something extraordinary. And you might notice that I have kind of the similar main point at the end of these last three sermons. It's because I'm trying to drive this point home that there is nothing so insignificant or broken about you that will keep you from being used by God. The only thing that will keep you from being used by God is you. All it takes is you having faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus can move mountains for those who have the faith. A faith even the size of a mustard seed, Jesus said. Mary had the faith that resembled a strong tower, a great faith. And Jesus was able to do so much with Mary's life because she was willing to be vulnerable in her brokenness. What about you today? How many of you sitting in this room today are still trying to hide some broken part of your life instead of taking it and laying it at the feet of Jesus? How many of you are still wondering each week why you don't feel any closer to Jesus than you did the week before? It's time to stop hiding and start worshiping. Bring your brokenness to Jesus today. Please stand as we pray. Father God, we come before you today and we lift our prayers to you this morning from a place of brokenness. Father God, we know even if our brokenness is from long ago or even if it's from something recent, we all walk into this building every week with some piece of brokenness in our lives. And Father, today as those who are here might be wrestling with that brokenness. Father, I pray that today they lay that brokenness at your feet. That they let go of that thing that they've been hiding, that thing that they've been holding on to. That they leave it at your feet, washed in the tears of repentance, bathing in your mercy, forgiveness, and righteousness. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you give us each week to come together and worship you. To sing our praises to you, to pray to you, to listen to your word, to take time to commune with one another in remembrance of your son Jesus and his sacrifice. Father, forgive us for those times when we have let our minds wander from what we're here to do. 
We love you. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, if you have something on your heart that you're carrying and you just want to pray with somebody, uh, Connie and Mike are back in the back of the room. Jim Hudson, one of our elders, and myself are up here in the front. Uh, We would love to spend time praying with you this morning. And uh, we've got time to do that even after the service if you want to stop us after the service and pray. Uh, You don't even have to tell us what you're wrestling with. If you just want somebody to pray with you, just tell us that you're struggling with your brokenness and you want to pray. We'd be happy to spend time doing that. If you need to uh, make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life and you've never done that, this would be a great day to come and to meet Jesus at the cross. Please come as we sing.